So I kind of just wanted to talk through. I every video I start and I say I just want to quickly, <laughs> you know. But I wanted to talk through history just a little bit because not only do the majority of um, Europeans in America, um, but truly everyone has great misconceptions as it relates to the current disposition, why it is, uh, where it is, um, and who owes a debt, who owes a debt, right? And, and I wanna kind of go through, you know, what you've heard, right? The justifications that we hear at the highest levels, which make sense to the people in the society, black and white, right? What they will say to you is no one alive ever owned or was a slave, right? Um, they will speak to the fact that uh, slavery had existed in different places in the world, right? They will use, he did it too, as a justification, right? They'll say, well, Africans sold you, right? As a means of absolving themselves and a nation of the last 400 years of atrocious behavior. They will use these things in conversation. So what I wanna do is I wanna kinda go through those justifications for inhumanity and disconnection and kind of try to discover through that conversation without ambiguity, who owes a debt, right? Now, when I say a debt, right? I'm not the collector, nah. <laughs> I'm not the debt collector. I didn't come as the debt collector, no. Nature is, the universe is, there's a universal law that comes to collect. It is a reckoning, a reckoning that comes to every household, to every man, woman, and child that owes a debt. Now let's talk that through. Who owes a debt? The debt must be levied upon everyone, every human being, that accepted benefit produced through a crime, yeah? If your wealth was predicated upon heinous crimes and perpetuated, then the wealth that was accumulated in that process is blood spoils and either Either you pay your debt or those spoils will rot in your mouth, right? So again, let's just kind of talk it through. When the Hungarians came to America as poor, tired, huddled masses of people with nothing but shirts on their backs, they came to this new world to take advantage of opportunity that did not exist where they were coming from. And so the opportunity that they came to enjoy, the social mobility that was promised in the journey was produced on the backs of innocent human beings over centuries. So while they might say my Hungarian great, 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 great grandfather that came here didn't own any slaves, it makes no difference because his passage was paid in pain and in misery. For if there had been no economy, if there was no opportunity for him to leave Hungary and come to America on a treacherous journey. If there was no beacon 
to call him, then he would not have come. What he never asked, what he never considered was who constructed the beacon that he saw that shone so brightly in his land, in his despair, in his misery, in Hungary, who erected the beacon. He never asked that question. Who was producing the food that when he arrived, poor, tired, huddled masses of people with nothing but shirts on their back, what meal was provided to him when he arrived on these shores? What did he eat? Where did he live? What did he do? How did he attain social mobility? He did so based on the misery inflicted on another people. How about the Lithuanians, the Germans, the Eastern Europeans? the Italians. Let's talk about the Chinese. Let's talk about the Hawaiians. Let's talk about the, uh, the uh, Portuguese. Let's talk about the various groups of people that have come into this country seeking opportunity. I don't care where they came from, Jamaica, Africa, I don't care where they came from, Brazil, doesn't really matter, right? It doesn't really matter. If those people came into the United States of America seeking opportunity and social mobility, well, you must understand that currency was produced on April 7th, 1792 in American history that currency was given value through breeding innocent 13 year old girls for 150 years. The dollar that you thirst with the pictures of dead slave owners, the dollars that you thirst had no value. They were given value in innocent human lives in the wombs of 13 year old girls bred until they could no longer reproduce for a century and a half. This is what produced the economy, okay? The, uh, the solvency that allowed this nation to erect a beacon so powerful that in Italy they could see it and in their darkness and in their misery, it shone through that in Portugal, they could see this beacon and its power. That in Berlin hmm, and in Poland and in Warsaw, right? And in all of Eastern Europe, huh, in Spain and in China and in Japan and all over the planet Earth, they saw this powerful beacon in the sky and they all came to it seeking a better life. You see, so when we ask the question, who owes a debt? The answer is very clear. Any human being that came to this land seeking an opportunity, that opportunity was produced in my blood. Hmm? doesn't matter how you might try to reconcile or change that or make it again. When we start to look at the justifications and the ways in which the masses uh, absolve themselves of that or dismiss that as being relevant. And we hear them say that slaves existed in other places, chattel slavery never existed until America. And imagine, Imagine you're standing in the face of the victim of human trafficking and they say to you, I am a victim of human trafficking. And you say to them, well, the Jews had it bad. Nah. I don't deny that the Jews had it bad. I don't. 
I recognize that when Europeans want to point to the absolute worst example of humans in modern history, they love to point to Adolf Hitler as being the worst. And they love to point to King Leopold and they, you know, they point to their dictators as if they're not making my point in that the very worst that human history has seen comes from their camp. But <clears throat> what they overlook in trying to point to these other people as being the greatest monsters in human history, what they overlook is the fact that Hitler did not breed innocent 13-year-old girls until they could no longer reproduce for 300 years. Hitler didn't do that, right? King Leopold didn't do that, right? They didn't have sex farms where they forced young boys to mate with their mothers for entertainment. They didn't have buck breaking right? They didn't have those conditions that plagued a innocent human being from the moment they were born until the moment that they died and did the same to their children and their children and their children for 20 generations. No, Hitler is not guilty of such. Hitler is not guilty of such. King Leopold is not guilty of such, right? So when we, when we assign to uh, history the greatest monsters and the worst men and the worst that it could be and to overlook the United States of America, to overlook what has been done right here is to overlook our own humanity. Hmm? And to further, again, speak to that very specific point very specific point, any human being in North America that came here voluntarily looking for opportunity found that opportunity that was produced in the misery of the only people that did not come voluntarily. That's just a fact. That's simply a fact. 79% of the world's cotton was being produced in the slave owning states in the South. This economy, your fantastic universities, your beautiful streets and bridges and roads and, and your edicts and constitutions and all of your bylaws and everything else could not have been possible were it not for the misery that you inflicted on another people. So here they sit today in 2020 using fancy words and, and everybody's Abe Lincoln today. You know what I'm saying? They're all, oh, we, 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 we are moral and humane today because of 50 years and a large, I marched with Martin Luther King button. Suddenly they're humane and moral. You practiced disconnection, hatred, immorality and atrocity for 400 years without skipping a single 60 second interval and you would like me to believe that in 50 years and a single march on washington a leopard has changed its spots i don't believe that let's dive into history a little bit shall we when the european left their lands they left under the guise, and we see it in the books today, it says it, they left to practice their freedoms, <laughs> to practice their freedoms. Now, what they call freedom is being witnessed today in 2020 um, in your various uh, uh, circles, in your perversion and pedophilia and, and in these different areas. Their freedoms were not what you think they were when one man one man can say freedom and it means different things to different people okay so they left their lands and now everywhere that they stopped every single place their foot touched terra firma they left pestilence they left raped people they left a new 
people and conflict in that area based on that, right? So they arrived in this new world, right? With people there. They arrived in this new world. And the first thing they did was begin to rape. They raped and raped every single, if you look at the migration pattern huh, and the way that they came here and look at the trail of tears that they left behind them. And then when they arrived on these different lands, they started to give them different names based on the fact that they were there. And they began raping those people and raping those people and raping them so much that they gave them new names and those names stuck. Today, the majority of my brothers and sisters that are Boricuan don't even understand that there's no such thing as uh, Puerto Rican, Puerto Rico, when you uh, translate Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico means rich port. There could be no people named rich port. So they're proud and they scream out Puerto Rico as if it was something to be proud of. What this actually celebrates is an ongoing and continuous rape of an indigenous people to the point where they do not know who they are what they are or what the traditions of their native families were. They have no idea, they've been erased. So what they did was they came in and they began raping, raping and murdering, raping and murdering. Now, just through basic proximity, right? The natives on this land had not developed immunities for the diseases that the European brought. And that decimated them in the tens of millions. It killed them, simple proximity. It is still to this day why vaccines are produced because of proximity to the European and the diseases that they brought, the measles, the mumps, the rubella, this was all theirs, okay? And so they came in and they decimated the people and they raped them. Everywhere they found them, they raped them. Okay, so now, again, it was quite the devious. It's, it's very elementary, but it was also very devious. What they had to do was, see, they couldn't enslave the people that were already on this land because they knew the land. They knew how to get away. They, their people were here. They would be able to get away, and it was proven. It happened, right? They tried. It didn't work. So what they did was they got a people that were not native to this land. Right? They went and kidnapped and stole and bought and did whatever they could to get Africans who were agriculturists, who were builders, who were scientists, who were astronomers, who were all of these different things. And they brought those people here. And because they were now in a land that was foreign to them, running north, south, east, or west, ran them into a plantation and no friends. So they were trapped. Now, in order to make a human into a slave, there was a couple of things that had to happen, okay? One of the first things you had to do was you had to take the father's name and you had to kill the mother's tongue, the language. You took the name and then you stole the language, okay? Then you made that individual dependent upon you for every essential need. Okay, they, they didn't have to consider rent and they couldn't do it, right? Not in this hostile environment. They could not possibly find a job or pay rent, okay? Nobody was going to hire them. And this, is, this was used, okay? So the food was a weapon. The water was a weapon. The healthcare was a weapon. The housing was a weapon. The security was a weapon. They told them, look, I'll let you go, but guess what? He gonna be worse than I am. Hmm? Least, least I, huh, right? He gonna be worse than I am so you can go. And guess what? Chances are great. He was right. You leave that plantation and you're bumping into, you know, I went fishing on a place called Bear Island down in the low country in South Carolina. And Bear Island, and in that area, that's also where um, Paris Island is, training for the Marines. Um, and this is the first area 
if you were taking a trip from Africa on the boat, this is the first place where you'll see land. So this is the first place they saw land and many of them jumped overboard, right? Not knowing where they were, they jumped overboard and they ran through these, these bogs and, and marshes. Um, and the scary part is that when they ran, they were running straight into a hundred plantations, straight. There was, no, there was no way in the world that where, from where they were running, they would not run into a plantation. So it was horrible, horrible. Okay. So again, they took the mother name, the mother's tongue, the father's name. They made the human completely dependent upon them. They didn't allow them to get their bearings as it relates to north, south, east, and west. And now you've got a people that are trapped. So a restate. They came and they began raping everybody, 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 right? They came in and they raped the natives and they decimated them with their disease. The African was more resilient. He didn't die the way from proximity. And so now they had a captive audience of Africans and they were importing them, right? And they're raping the whole time. They're raping. This has been about rape and sexual perversion. It always has been, right? Okay, so they're raping, they're raping, they're raping. Fine. Emancipation Proclamation happens. All of a sudden, there is no longer a captive audience for them to rape. Right? They no longer have black women in the, in the back that they can simply go and rape. And so what did they do? From the Emancipation Proclamation, 1869 forward, they began raping their own children and their own grandchildren. They did this uh, so uniformly that the 1960s saw a, uh, a movement of white women that came out with hairy armpits and, 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 and angry, angry. And they pointed a finger at their grandfather and at their grandmother. And they said, you raped me and you didn't say anything. And the sixties saw this huge influx of white women coming forward saying, yo, you was a monster to me. This, is based on the history. So what happened in the 60s is these women came, stepped up. They were brave. They were brave. They stepped up and said, this is wrong, but here's what happened. See, here's what happened. What they didn't understand was that they were forcing that on our women for 300 years. So while Sally's crying tears for her own condition, she overlooked the fact that the reason that uh, that that occurred is because the perversion was was cultivated in her family and perpetrated upon my family for 300 years. So is Sally innocent? See, Sally had a had a, a nice house. Sally sat at that table and ate food from the blood spoils. You see, her mother was sucked on the food that was produced in the misery and innocent human lives, you see. So is, is little Sally innocent? I feel for the condition. I feel for what it was that their grandparents did to them. That's a monstrous thing. That's a monstrous thing, but that's your family. That's your family that did that. And, and that crime was predicated upon the fact that you allowed a perversion to be cultivated for hundreds of years and you thought it was completely okay while it was happening to black women. You thought it was completely okay while it was happening to native women. You turned a blind eye. Your mother turned a blind eye. Your grandmother turned a blind eye to, to her husband going out and raping black women, hmm? children. Hmm? Yeah. So again, we spin back around to the question, who owes a debt? Who owes a debt? Every single human who voluntarily came to the United States of America owes a debt to the people who involuntarily were forced here to build an economy and a system that all could find opportunity in. If I'm wrong, tell me I'm wrong. If everything that you're using and everything in your society was produced in blood spoils, in the misery and the horror 
in another, in an innocent people's lives. You tell me how you sleep at night, how you absolve yourself while you eat better than they do, while you live better than they do, while they are 100% dependent upon you. You tell me, how do you sleep at night? How do you look at your babies in love and not consider the humans that lived in hell in order to produce that for you? How do you do that? Bruh, I ain't, the, you know, look, I'm not the demon whisperer. I don't, that ain't nothing. Nah, that's a rhetorical question and one that you must reconcile inside of yourself. Has nothing to do with me. I will say, however, there is a reason why these conversations go not very far. Um, and that happens between black and white people. These conversations, these things that I'm saying are not popular. People do not want to have this conversation. Black people would like to absolve white people because white people have been absolving themselves for so very long. So the black people will say things that sound very much like Stormfront. They sound like the excuses. They'll say, yeah, that happened, but yeah, that happened, and yeah, that happened. And they go past it as if it doesn't dictate absolutely every single thing that you see in this society today. The reason that the healthcare system is crumbling is because of the gynecological practices and the horrors that they put on my black sisters over hundreds of years. The reason that their economy is crumbling is because the value in their currency was produced in, in the breeding of innocent little girls. The reason that every single thing that they touch turns to a rock and that water can't slake their thirst, they run out of water. The reason that things are happening is because you have produced your solvency, you have produced your utopia in genocide. You have produced your, your dream world in the crimes against innocent human beings. You can't do that, quite simply. I can't do it, you can't do it, no nation can do it, no people can do it. And because your family came poor, tired, huddled masses of people, and because they may not have ever had a slave, they came and they accepted the spoils. You accepted a share in the opportunity produced in the misery of innocent human beings. And because you accepted a share in the spoils, you accept the shame associated with the crime. One hundred percent of you. And I speak to a reckoning. I speak to a reckoning. You know, there's a a sect of Muslims called um, the Sufis. And the Sufis believe that it is better to experience punishment on earth than to experience the wrath of Allah in eternity. So they inflict pain on themselves. They have a wooden board and they, they hit their heads and they inflict pain and the, the, the logic being to atone for sin on earth because it would be better to do so than to experience the wrath of infinity. I suggest that a reckoning is upon us and it would be better for the European, for the Hungarian, the Lithuanian, the Portuguese, the, the Hispanic. It would be better for the Chinese, for the Japanese. It would be better for each and every one of you who have come to this nation and enjoyed the opportunity that was produced in my blood. It would be better if you simply atoned. How do you atone? Baby, I don't need nothing. Ain't nothing that you got that I need. But you want to talk atonement, run everything. 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 Not, there's no, there's nothing. There is nothing that you should hold back. And I may be graceful enough to keep it. 
uh, or to uh, uh, not want what you have. But you, yeah, you want to, you, you, hey, again, I don't need nothing you got. But the fact is, to atone, if you were true human, if you were moral, you see, if you came to me and told me, yo, that house you're living in, that was my grandfather's house. And your grandfather did some sneaky shit and killed my grandfather and got his name on it. And now you all live in my house, but it's not yours. And you came to me and told me that, bruh, and could prove this as being true. What kind of man would I be? Would I keep that house? Is it my house? Is that my stuff? Because hmm? it was handed down? Because I overlook and absolve of the crime? Hmm? Is that mine? So you want to <clears throat> play humane to the rest of the world. You want to speak morality to the rest of the world. I know where your humanity came from. I gave it to you. I know where your morality came from. I gave it to you. I know where your technological advance came from. I gave it to you. I know where your understanding of mathematics came from because I gave it to you. I gave you an understanding of science. I gave you an understanding of astrology. I gave that to you. So uh, again, you can put on that mask and show the world that you're so awesome, but I will tell you again, a reckoning approaches. Now, I very rarely have this conversation with anybody. Why? It doesn't make a lot of sense and at the end of the day if i'm going to expend energy there must be a win at the end there must be a gain why would i speak for no reason if there is no gain if there is no win then all i'm doing is wasting my breath and my energy so i very rarely engage in this level of conversation or in specific relative to american history but there are those things that definitely should be spoken and understood very clearly because today in 2020 while they will take the flag out of your hand <laughs> and run up the street and say yeah black lives matter right they're not actually talking about relinquishing any of the blood spoils that they have hmm. they'll take that that you know like support our troops it's very easy and it requires no personal investment it's just something that you can say Right. So they, they, they put on the mask of the champion of humanity and morality, but they do not relinquish the spoils that came along with these crimes. And when you speak with them, they'll yes you to death. Yes, 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 I understand. But you ain't gave you ain't came up off of nothing. You still got the houses. You still got the land. It's still deeded to you. You still got control. We're still dependent upon you. And everybody is comfortable with that, black and white, is very comfortable with that. Because as long as you have daily bread, you won't complain. And as long as their children are going to be solvent based on your children's dependency, they won't complain. So the two of you move forward through history in a codependent, unhealthy relationship, one supporting the other and the other supporting the one. Hmm? But when you have a conversation, what you will find is that they are unable to really connect to what it is that you're saying. They can't connect humanity to the occurrences. They can't see humans in this equation. Why? Well, imagine if you will. See, this was a crime of commission and omission. They did it to us, but they hid it from themselves, right? They hid it from themselves. So they didn't tell, they didn't, they, they ain't nobody, it, so you would tell the story of courage. I can tell the story of London Attis, who fought the Revolutionary War and was ordered back into slavery. And then when he came out, he was the only man in the area that could slip past the British ships that were in Machias, Maine, in the, in the waterways. And he could slip past the ships, get down to Boston, get salt and bring that salt back up to Maine. He was the only man that could do it. He's kept those people alive. He was a hero. I can tell stories 
of great triumph. My, uh, um, a man that came to marry into the Addis family was Peter Lee Henry in New Jersey, very famous story. Peter Lee Henry had escaped slavery in the South. He stole his master's boat and dipped and he made it up into New Jersey. And he was living in New Jersey for some years. And one of his boys, a black man, tricked him into crossing over this bridge in New Jersey, going into New York, into Hempstead, New York. And when he crossed over that bridge, there were three white men that were waiting on the other side of the bridge. They jumped him, beat him up, and brought him back into slavery. A long court case ensued. And at the end of the trial, he was granted to those three white men as their slave. And as history tells, that was the end of the story. He died in slavery. Five years later, less maybe less than five years, a man named Peter Lee pops up in Machias, Maine and has babies and the Lee line is produced in Machias, Maine and lived up there until the 1960s. I can tell amazing stories about my family. Guess what? Europeans do not have those stories that omit atrocity. So again, this was a crime of commission because they committed it to us, but it was a crime of omission because they hid it from themselves and from their children. They didn't have illustrious stories to pass down. Hmm? So how does this happen? How does a person become so detached? Imagine, if you will, and again, what happens is we focus on our experience. We, we, we know what happened to us and we wanna tell that story, but let's for a second tell their story, right? What did it look like on their side, see? Because again, and I've gone through this story before, but in slave owning states, marriage didn't happen for love, right? It didn't happen for love, it, ha it happened for the control of land, okay? So what would happen was a slave owning father would be sitting and drinking with his slave owning friend. And he would say to him, yo, I got a 13 year old daughter here and you're not married, take my daughter, union, we make a union in our families and we keep this land in our families and we grow together, how about that? And so that man would take his daughter and they'd take, he'd take him, her away to his plantation far off where she knows nobody. So now she's ridden all the way away to this man's plantation He's a slave owner, and now she's living in this big house, isolated, doesn't know anybody, doesn't have any friends, can't call on a cell phone and talk to nobody. She's alone. Okay. They have a child. Okay. Now, again, that man doesn't love that little girl. That little girl doesn't love that man. And neither of them actually love the baby. We'll get to that in a second. But they produce a child. And that man determines that, and this was a, a problem in the South because they felt that the woman was not <clears throat> qualified, was not qualified to breastfeed her own child. So while they thought that the black people were not human, they still took their baby and put that on the black woman's breast. Imagine that, you thought she wasn't human, but you gave your baby to her to breastfeed. Okay, so that baby, is reared by that black woman in the back and that family. That baby is raised with that family. See, the mother is still isolated. She doesn't have any skills. So she's sitting in the house and alone uh, in the dark. That man is out in his conquest mode. He's doing everything that he's doing, but she's sitting alone. She's afraid because she's sitting on a plantation with 150 of y'all. You understand what I'm saying? And she's scared. Okay. You got overseers that are walking around and they're making lewd comments to her and all like that. This is a whole nasty little thing going down, right? But she's not trusted to rear those children. So the children are reared in the back. Okay. And they play with those children. They grow up with those children. Everything that they learn about love and family and relationships, they learn from back there, not from in the house. The only time that they sit with their parents is at dinner time and Mammy and Uncle Ben are in earshot and they're serving the food. That is the only time that that child is around that mother and father. So they have all of the nice things. They've got the facade, right? They've got the fine china and the big uh, house and they've got the buggies and all of that thing, but they got no love. There's no love there, 
right? There has been no bonding between that mother and the child. There has been no bonding between that father and the child. And there has been no bonding between that woman and that man. This is nothing. This is not a family, right? Okay. At some point, the father determines I'm going to teach my child how things are. So those same people that raised that child that he has a relationship with, that father goes in and he says, okay, we're gonna rape this one or we're gonna lynch this one or we're gonna whip this one, right? Or we're gonna withhold food or we're, gonna, we're going to uh, levy cruelty upon these people for whom you have a relationship and with whom you had a, a bond and a connection. And the child resists. When they see horror, naturally they resist. This isn't normal, this isn't cool. You're doing this to my friends and my friend's father. I'm listening to the child cry as you do this to his father. So the child resists, but there is reward associated with acceptance and there is punishment associated with resistance. And so the child over time acquiesces to the idea that this is natural and they begin and practice this for 20 generations from father to son, from father to son, from mother to daughter, from mother to daughter. It is so abhorrent that it, it was a common practice for them to have a picnic to pick a man out, to hang him from a tree, light him on fire, cut off of his genitals, create jewelry from his genitals and hang those over his loved one's neck like it was jewelry. Someone's genitals. I suggest to you that they ingested apathy, hatred and disconnection and practiced, cultivated, and handed it down father to son, father to son, mother to daughter for 20 generations. If you perform these acts, I don't care who you are. I don't care what people we speak about. If they do this consistently over a protracted period of time, what will you find at the end of this experience? Will you find a whole connected, moral, and humane individual? You will produce a monster. That is what you will produce. And so now, as you look through the society in 2020, you see apathy, you see disconnection, you see hatred, you see extremism. These are the most common attributes that you see through the society today because it was bred into them over 20 generations. It has become the primary operating system for which they cannot deviate, for which they cannot deviate. You would not expect a dog to meow. It is not in his nature. So it is not in the nature of the people within this society to be able to deviate from their primary operating system. It's not possible. So when you look into their eyes and have these conversations and their eyes glaze over, it is because of the nature that they have produced. They have now created a hole where a human used to be. Okay? So there, it makes no sense. There is nothing that I could say to change their fate. Furthermore, nothing that I need exists in their hands. Nothing. Again, I, I, I don't mean to attack your leaders. I don't mean to assault your leaders. I really don't. But I go and I listen to them talk about each other and they point each the point fingers at each other at how great they are kind of like the like like what the european does when they go into their meetings and they everybody's great and we're all great and everybody's great and you're great and we're great and right same thing we're all great everybody's great we're all great right yeah but i i quickly ask one question to these leaders who you follow and the question that i ask of them is if the white man's economy fell tomorrow what happens to your plans what happens to your plans, Roly Poly, Moist Watkins? What happens to your plans? If the white man's system fell tomorrow, 
what would happen to your plan? And if it would fall apart and it would be absolutely nothing, then what that means is for your plan to work, then the white man must be solvent. So what that necessarily means by transitive properties is you are an agent of white supremacy because without that system, nothing that you're doing could come to pass. Nothing that you're doing could come to pass without his system. So you become an agent of white supremacy. All of them. I don't mean to assault your leaders, man, but how am I not say the truth? How, if, if I'm lying, if, I, if what I'm saying is incorrect, correct me, I'm open. I am open. If I'm wrong, I'll say I'm wrong. I'm good with that. I'm not, I'm not proud. But if what I'm saying is true, and if the white man's economy or system fell tomorrow, and all of your leaders' plans would then fail, then your leaders are counting on white supremacy and then by transitive properties are agents of white supremacy because they need it to be standing. Anybody you're listening to that needs their enemy to be standing is a fool. And if you're following them, then it makes you a bigger fool. If they need their enemy to be standing in order for their plans to succeed, then their plans are to be slaves, period. Marcus Garvey said, any leadership that teaches you to depend upon another race is a leadership that enslaves you. Elijah Muhammad said, one day white people would not be solvent enough to be able to continue to carry black people and their essential needs. What will happen on that day? Listen to your leaders. Listen to everybody that sounds good. They sound so politically savvy. I love it. You sound awesome. I, but the problem is, and I could say it until I was blue in the face, and every time I say it, their answer is, I love my family's master. I never let them go. Like, I get that. I get that. Um, it's not for me, but I understand that that's where you are. You understand? And so, again, I'm going to wrap up. I'm not going not gonna to do this forever. Again, there's no win. There is no, I'm not even going to get a cookie at the end. I gain nothing through this conversation. My time is better spent producing alliances and building uh, our future. My, my time is better spent not speaking about where we are and trying to educate my people on things that they should know. My time is not spent well in that regard. My time is not spent well educating white folk on the whole that exists within them and trying to shore that up. They ain't got nothing to do with me. I got nothing to do with me. What, where, what you got to do, the, the road you got to hoe, ain't got nothing to do with me. What I'm focused on is building what is necessary for my people for the next 1,000 generations. And that's the only thing. That's the only win. And can't nobody give me that win. So I very rarely spend time in these types of conversations, very rarely. But I felt it was important to inject into the narrative the true thinking and the true ism that when we ask the question, who in this nation owes a debt? The answer is very clearly, anybody that came to this nation voluntarily has taken advantage of the spoils and taken a share in the crimes that were committed against our families. So if you enjoy your life here in America, you enjoy the things that you have here. It came from our blood and you do owe a debt and it will be paid one way or another. You ain't got to pay me, as like I said, I build my own fortune. I make what happened what I need to see happen. That ain't got nothing to do with me. I'll walk away as you turn to a pillar of salt. I won't look back. I simply speak to mind trapped in this mindset and hope Again, light is provided through sparks of energy from the mind that travel in rhyme form. My hope is that, you know, again, somebody gets sparked. Somebody hears and recognizes the truth in these words and begins to do those things necessary to come out of it. There is only one answer. It doesn't exist in another man's hands. It exists in ours. You ready to build? Step forward like a man. We build.